I'm in Mark chapter 4. Um, if you've been uh, part of a church for any history of time, this is going to be a familiar story. If you're new to the church, this is going to be an awesome story. Uh, it's one of the most incredible stories uh, that you may hear for the very first time today. And again, this is not just a story. This is history. This is a true story. And uh, so we're going we're gonna to come right into Mark, actually parachute right into the 35th verse of chapter uh, 4. If I, maybe I need to do this real quick. Um, this is, Jesus has been ministering all day uh, at the sea. There's so many people that call it the multitude that can't count. Uh, he actually has to step in, into the boat and he's preaching this message uh, from the boat itself. He says he sat down and that tells you that he's been preaching a long time. And in Peru, uh, we go to Chiapas, and it's the same thing. They walk hours, three and four, five hours to go to church. And so church isn't an hour long. Because if you walk three or four hours to church, you don't want an hour service. You want to stay there for some time. And, and so they came to see Jesus from all the surrounding villages. So they, when they come to see Jesus, they want to hear from him. So they're there a long time, and Jesus is ministering. This is where we have the parable of the sower in this moment, Jesus just came, he just finished that. He, he t- talks about several uh, different things. He, he explains the parable. He also, I believe he, he talks about the, uh, the parable of the mustard seed growing up, the smallest seed, but grows up to be the biggest plant. This is where this message is being taught. And so now we're going to jump right into the story in verse 35. As evening came, okay, hold on right, real quick. So all pastors follow Jesus and all pastors are long-winded because it's evening, and Jesus is still talking. He's still preaching. As evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross over to the other side, or other side of the lake. So they took Jesus in the boat and started out, leaving crowds behind, although other boats followed. Now, these are small little little boats, some fishing boats, and those still weren't very big. And you're talking about little boats, rowboats, all different sized boats, but several followed. But soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat, and it began to fill with water. Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. The disciples woke him up, shouting, Teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? And when Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Silence, be still. Suddenly the wind stopped, and there was a great calm. Then he asked them, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? The disciples were absolutely terrified. Who is this man? They asked each other. Even the wind and waves obey him. I love this story. I love this story for lots and lots of reasons, but I really want to dive in today and maybe pull this apart and open it up for us today and see what the Holy Spirit would speak to us. Again, there's thousands of people coming. They're listening to Jesus. It's a, it, the day has come. Maybe it's beginning to be sunset, evening, it says. And so he says, let's go to the other side. And I think that's really important. It's really important when you hear God, in this case, Jesus speaks, and he tells us, let's go to the other side. He tells you to come to Courageous Church. He sends you on an assignment. You've got a word from God. There's something that comes alive in your heart. I'm sure I, I can, I, I've never met you, but I'm sure Peru was probably not on your radar until God spoke. And when God spoke, Peru, you can't get away from it because something just comes alive in you. It's like a fire that bursts inside you. I remember with the Chathams, Debbie and I were so wise in pastoring. And we felt like the time had come to meet with the Chathams and say, I believe the Lord wants to elevate you in the house of God at our church. And uh, they looked at us, and they looked at each other like, yeah, God's calling us to Salt Lake City, Utah. <laughs> We're thinking, what? <laughs> so we, we felt in our hearts, God, it was their season to be elevated. We had no idea God was sending them here. And we, we absolutely, Debbie and I, we, we, we've told this story many times, and we can recount it. In our hearts, yes, it was a great loss, but the excitement, knowing it was right, that God had spoken. And you have a word, Jason. Candace, God gave you guys a word to come here. And this message is for you today. It's for everyone here, but I believe God really wants me to speak 
this live word into your spirit. Amen? Amen? Because he said, let's go to the other side. Let's go to Salt Lake City. I've got a work to do. And oftentimes, as the story goes, we get out on the journey on the lake of life and things happen. Are you tracking with me today? This is crazy to me, this story. Let me tell you one of the things that's really, really crazy to me. One of the things that actually just kind of mesmerizes my thoughts on this. The storm hadn't happened and it came up suddenly, it says, right? But here it is. Jesus said, let's go to the other side. And then a storm arose suddenly. It's amazing to me, we can be right in the middle of God's will. I mean, we're smack dab in the middle of God's will, and Jesus is right there with us. And the storm can come up. How many, let's see if I'm tracking with anybody. How many have ever been, you know you're right in the middle of what God said, but you're facing storms? in your life. They just come up and blow up and you're like, what in the world? Okay. I mean, I, I'm thinking as, as, if I'm one of the disciples, I'm thinking to myself, look at guys, look at the thousands of people. They'd stay here for days of Jesus. I mean, come on. And we're right here next to Jesus. Matter of fact, this is my boat. That's my boat Jesus is speaking from. Hey, you know the parable of the sower? My boat. That was my boat. I mean, that's how we think, right? As, 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 as human beings, we think, yeah, the message is great, but did you notice it was from my boat? <laughs> Jesus sat in my boat, right? And the disciples are like, yeah, man, did you see me sitting right next to Jesus when he talked about the mustard seed? You know, I bet he's talking about me. I'm going to grow up to be big and mighty, and people are going to come and be attracted to my ministry, you know? I mean, we get crazy when we start thinking about things like this, but I think the disciples are just like you and I, just, I mean, we're just like me. We think that everything that's going on is about us. And Jesus is trying to communicate. Listen, this is why. I'll give you why I say that statement, why I put that statement out. Because we get to eavesdrop on one of the conversations the disciples have in Luke 22, verse 24. Here, this is such a wonderful, anointed moment of thinking. Then they, being the disciples, began to argue among themselves about who would be the greatest among them. So don't tell me the disciples are walking on water. They, they are thinking just on the same plane we tend to think on, right? They're thinking, Jesus, man, he is, his ministry is blowing up. I bet I'm going to be like his number one. No, no, I'm the number one. Don't, he calls me the rock, Right? I mean, Dwayne Johnson's got nothing on Peter. Come on. But what they failed to recognize is that everything, everything, to be a disciple of Jesus, you're going to have to go through some stuff that you are not prepared to go through. There's always a cost to be paid. No matter if you're starting a business, starting a family, there's cost to be paid. And the kingdom of God and walking with Jesus is no different. There's a cost that's going to be paid. Amen? I, I like this little quote. It says, struggles are the workout plan your dreams use to materialize. Struggles are the workout plan your dreams use to materialize. The fierce storm, the squall, Matter of fact, these are not uncommon to the Sea of Galilee. As a matter of fact, last year they had one of these storms uh, that hit. I think it was in the spring. 87 mile per hour winds hit the Sea of Galilee because the mountains, the high, hot wind comes down and forces the cold air that's upon the sea, and it just can be violent in seconds. It's, it's, it's really a phenomenon. I've got some pictures. I've got a video. You want to see it real quick? This is from last year. This is Tiberius. How do you like that? Last year, this is some pictures of the aftermath of, of Tiberius, over $50 million 
worth of damage last year to the shoreline of Tiberias. So this is, this is common. And I want us to think about these waves and think about this for a moment, have this imagery, because sometimes it's hard to get images in our mind because it's the Sea of Galilee. We haven't never been over there. We don't know what it's like, you know. But this is, this is actual footage, and it helps us kind of plant where we're at, thinking about these, these winds and these waves, and they're caught in the middle of the storm. Matthew 5 says, For he makes his sun rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the just and the unjust. That tells me this. You can be walking with Jesus and experience the sunlight upon your face, but you can also face a storm. You could be living like the devil and you'll experience sunlight on your face and experience a storm in life. Amen? And that's tough for us. From, my, from where I grew up, I'm just my spiritual background. My spiritual background taught that if life is good, you're blessed in the sense of financial bless, health, your family's good, you got a great job, you're, you're, everything's rolling, guess what? The favor of God's on your life. But if something happens bad, something pulls against you, you're facing a storm in life, then you've got serious sin in your life and you're not living for God in some area and there's judgment upon you. I was raised that way. In the, in, in, and I'm telling you, as I began to study God's word, I do not see the foundational truth in God's word anywhere. Matter of fact, I read and I see people who are living like the devil, the patience and endurance of God to still win them. Over and over for generations. Please come. Please. You see God's mercy extended. And I, I, again, that framed a little bit of my mindset approaching God is that if things are good in my life, then I'm blessed of God. If things are bad in my life, then God's blessing's not on me. This, this, this story right here, it abolishes that argument because like I've already said, you can be in the center of God's will with Jesus on the boat and still face a storm and it doesn't mean you're not blessed. Is that all right? Let me make it a little more personal. You can hear God speak to you and give you a vision to send you to a city called Salt Lake City, Utah. Give you a word, give you a name of a church, courageous church, give you a mission, give you a vision, give you a call, and you come to Salt Lake City and you begin to meet people and start building a team. And then you're ready to launch the church about three years ago, if I'm, my, my timing is about right. About three years ago, and you launch, and you gather people, and things are starting to happen. And I remember being at the launch service. It was awesome. Who was there with the recliners in the movie theater chairs? Come on, man. I remember they were cooking popcorn for us as we left the church that day. I was like, this is the will of God. A movie popcorn. If nothing brings you back to church, a movie popcorn will. <sighs> things are rolling. I mean, you had a full band. It was incredible. What an amazing start to any church. I'm, we've planted a church, and we know it's not easy to do. And, and, and so things get rolling. God's blessing and his favor. He's breathing on things. And you start like you start so, uh, small groups. You start your next step things. And you start your plans, and you start ministry. You go out into the community, start feeding people. And then a global pandemic shuts it all down. Talk about a storm. Now, instead of God, thank you, look what you're doing. Oh, we got new people coming in. This is amazing. Now the prayers are, dear God, what are we going to do now? Where are we going to go? Movie theaters shut us down. We can't even meet there. Where are we going to meet? Where are we going to go? Seven locations and three years later. You can question, God. Where are you in this? Just trying to make it real for us. Amen? Success most of the time in our lives is never the definition of success in God's mind. 
Isaiah 55, 8 supports that statement. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and neither your ways my ways, declares the Lord. So here's my setup question. We're going to move really quick now. Um, this is really spiritual, so I need you to really tune in, okay? Have you ever seen the movie Inception? Who's seen the movie Inception? See, I knew you had some church members that really follow God. If you've seen the movie Inception. Now, I love the movie Inception. It's one of my favorite movies of all time. And if you haven't seen it, uh, I don't want to ruin it. I, I don't recommend seeing it, but I recommend seeing it. Um, it is a movie that it's a dream inside of a dream inside of a dream. And you go, if you've never seen it, you're like, what are you talking about? That's kind of how you feel through the whole movie. You're like, what is going on? And who's dreaming? Who's dreaming right now? And whose dream is this? And it's layers of dreams. And it's just like, um, it's just amazing to me. It, to me, the, the writing is just super, super awesome. And you're, the levels of dreams. I want to approach today. I just have three simple points. I want to approach today's story in, in that kind of idea. There's a storm but I believe there's three storms that are in this storm. So do you guys want to go on a journey and discover the three storms? All right. Number one, the three storms, circumstantial storm. The first storm is the circumstantial storm. Look at verse 37. But soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat, and it began to fill with water. I told you a little bit about my childhood background. I actually was raised Pentecostal. Does everybody know what Pentecostal, that might be foreign. Pentecostal is like, seriously, literally, people get so excited, they would stand up and run, literally run around the church. I mean, and, and, I mean, I mean, it was crazy. It was crazy. And so as a little guy, I'm watching this going, whoa. It was emotional, just emotional. And then we, we kind of matured and went into the Assemblies of God church that kind of looked like this. And then we moved to the charismatic movement. And then we went to the Presbyterian church. And I went from people allowed to scream, run around, just holler, Jesus, you know, just crazy for Jesus, to you can't stand up unless there's an asterisk in the bulletin. All right? So I feel like I've got a, a pretty good right? Reciting the creeds and all that. You don't, you never clap and you sing only hymns. It's just, I feel like I'm a spiritual mutt, to be honest with you. That's my pedigree as, 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 as a, a church, church goer. And I have discovered along the way that in every church, there are circumstances going on that are out of my control. And no one's got it all figured out. And I think that's really pretty awesome because God's saying, come follow me. And we just are invited to follow Jesus. And as the storms happen within the structures, he is still the steady force and still the steady course. And he's still at the helm. Amen. So we're talking about the this, this circumstantial storm. This is what it is. I'm going bro to break it down to three because he gave, in this passage, gave us three things. There was a fierce storm. If you look at the original Greek, it means a savage storm, a ferocious storm. It's a storm like a hurricane that comes up. This is, these guys are professional fishermen, and yet they're saying, we're going to drown here. Death is imminent. These guys knew how to navigate the Sea of Galilee. They've been on it. They've seen every kind, of, every kind of storm there is. They've seen it. This is not a storm they've ever witnessed before. In other words, this is the storm you face in life that's above your skill and abilities to handle. It's beyond you. And you find yourself groping and trying to figure it out. Number two, there were high waves. These are the, these are the descriptives of the storm. Fear storm with high waves. What is the high waves? I believe the high waves are those things that are really intimidating to us. Because what happens is as the waves begin to crest and they hit like that, hit the seashore wall, they blow up and all you can see is the waves. And I was listening, because I had seen that video obviously before, I was listening to what, what, what sound you would make. And I heard this, 
oh, from all of you. Because your focus was on the storm and the wave. And what happens is the high waves tend to block out our view of God. And so the things that hit us in a storm, lack of resources, cancer, to start naming life's storms, they come with huge waves and they intimidate us. Are you tracking with me? Is it okay? It blocks out our ability to see God. It also blocks out, it blocks out the ability to see the safe place God has provided. Everything becomes at risk, which leads to the last one. The boat was filling with water. This is a place that relationships, it's a place, a circumstance that once was dependable and trustworthy in your life is no longer a place that is dependable and trustworthy. The boat that was carrying you safely is now the container of your death. That's a storm. Storms in life. I'm just going to list a few, and I did already. This was a storm that I faced as a child, abandonment. I was abandoned by my mother. My sister and I was. My dad was into ministry, and so he would drop us off at homes, strangers, people. I mean, we didn't have a clue, so he would pursue ministry. So I felt, we felt abandoned. I felt abandoned as my father. And then when we planted a church, guess what happened? It, st- it started a struggle, started going through some storms, and I felt like God abandoned us. It's a storm. Some of the storms you have been carrying for a long, long time, some, uh, some storms like COVID, you're still in the midst of the storm. And there's other storms no one knows you're carrying. There could be a divorce, rape. You have a child that's walked away from God. Broken family relationships, you're not talking to one another. Financial pressures, business failures, criminal history. You spent some time in jail and in prison dealing with addictions, depressions, anxieties, and fears. These are just some storms. And probably, if you haven't, you know somebody very intimately that has faced one of those storms, if not more. Storms come up fast, and they can intimidate us. It can get us in a place where all we can see is the slamming of the waves and the water filling the boat of our lives, which leads to the second storm, which is called the emotional storm. Jesus, in verse 38, was sleeping at the back of the boat uh, with his head on a cushion. Now, listen, I tend, I, I, I desire, when I study God's word, I desire to demystify and, and de-religiousize this Bible and try to place myself in the very moment that's being written and try to see it and feel it and explain it. And hermeneutics, is, that's a theological term, trying to, dis, you know, doing the proper study. But I really want to say, if I was there, what would I be thinking? What would I be going through? What would be rising up within me, Right? And so what kind of emotions? So this is some things, these are some notes that I put down just kind of thinking on myself here, what I would do. Can you imagine how offended the disciples must have been in this moment? Jesus is sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. Don't tell me they weren't offended. They had to be highly offended. I can just imagine. They're grabbing, they're grabbing everything. They can't grab their shoes because they wear sandals so they can't bail water out with their sandals. They're grabbing everything they can to get the water out of the boat, right? I mean, they're trying everything they can. They're trying to tack. They're trying to do everything they can as being semen, professional semen, but nothing's working. And they glance Jesus, the Savior of the world. Sleeping. Hey, buddy, it's all hands on deck time. This is not sleepy, sleepy time. Hello, Jesus. I mean, listen, I don't want to, listen, if you've got Jesus high on a pedestal, I'm not here to knock him off. I'm just saying the disciples are just real guys. 
They're just real guys. And they had to be thinking this, because, and I'll prove it later just in just a moment, by what they said to Jesus. But I think they were super highly offended that Jesus was just taking a nap. I get you, Jesus, I get you. You've been ministering all day. You're exhausted. I get it. You need some donuts and some cider. I get it. It's going to be okay, Jesus. It's all right. We got cushions for you. We are dying here. And are you kidding me? You can't wake up and help? I think they really were having a tough time with that. One of the reasons I think that is because the description is so clear. Why why didn't the Bible just say, and Jesus was resting? No, no, no. John's going to make sure. No, I'm going to tell you exactly what Jesus was doing at this time. He was sleeping in the back of the boat, the most peaceful place of the boat, and his head was on a cushion. I just hear a little dripping sarcasm out of John right there. The beloved one. John calls himself the beloved, right? Yeah, I think he was having a tough time, right? And then what? Verse 40. Then Jesus asked, he being Jesus, then he asked them, why are you afraid? I want to punch him in the throat right there. (laughs) Are you serious, Jesus? You're going to ask us why we're... Hello? Right? But... This is our emotional responses to storms. We attack the one that can save us. Why, God, did you let this happen? If you were a loving God, you would do it differently. God, why would you want us to suffer to the point of near death? That can't be you. I think all that's working. Then he asked them, why are you, why are you afraid? You just want to rip the halo off the head of Jesus sometimes. I'm, I'm just going to be real, guys. Right? Listen, I can give you platitudes and, and, and make you think, like, wow, he's got his theology, theology down. But I think, that, I think we need to get real with the word of God. Because it wants to speak to our hearts right where we're really at. Amen? So can we just get real today? Is that okay? All right, let's go. Let's go. So let me draw draw the attention, the timeline to Jesus asking this question. Notice when he was awakened, notice he didn't ask the question, hey, why are you guys afraid? It seemed like that would be the appropriate time to ask that question. Right? He is so dead asleep that the waves tossing the boat, the stinging of the water coming in, you would think he's probably half soaked if they're certain to drown in the next minute or so. Jesus has got to be wet. He's got to have the effects. He's in the boat. So why would he wake up and go, why are you guys afraid? But Jesus doesn't do that, does he? Jesus wakes up and goes, silence, be still. And the wind ceased, and the Sea of Galilee went to glass in a moment. Woohoo! I mean, that's cool if you ask me. Thank you. I, I, that's, that belongs to him. What's the next thing he says? Why are you afraid? I just think it's just out of place in the story. Uh, uh, Jesus just. You just remember what you just did like two seconds ago? Right? Why, why would you ask us if we're afraid? It just doesn't, to me, it doesn't seem like Jesus is asking the appropriate thing there. I think if I was Jesus, this is what I think it should say. Hey, fellas, be still. Just make sure you get where I'm at. Be still. Silence. Be still. Waves. Everything's done. I think the next thing that seems right is Jesus to go over, hey, fellas, you okay? It's going to be all right. Start rubbing the back of Peter. It's all right, buddy. See, I took care of things. It's good. Isn't that awesome? What do you think about that deal, huh? Doesn't that make more sense? Wouldn't, Wouldn't he comfort and encourage their hearts? 
But he doesn't. He says, why are you afraid? To me, I'm just telling you, I'd look at that and go, I'm just not sure I understand what Jesus is really asking here. Because the waves are done, the wind stopped blowing, so there's nothing to ask to him or ask the disciples what they're afraid about. Or is there? I believe this, and I'll just submit this to your feet for consideration. I believe Jesus is asking about the second storm. He already took care of the first storm, the circumstantial storm, the wind and the waves. But now Jesus is asking, why are you afraid? Your soul is troubled. Your thoughts are troubled. Why are you emotionally distraught? Again, I want you to consider that as we move to the third one. The third one, the third storm is the theological storm. Verse 38, Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion, and the disciples woke him up. Dear Jesus, would you mind waking up right now? Jesus, can, can hello, Jesus, I don't want to, sorry, Jesus. No, I think they did what my dad did when I was a young kid, right? It's like I'm in, I'm in junior high. My dad's going off to work early. I was the only bedroom downstairs, right? And I had my little twin bed. The door's open. My dad come in, and he would, he, would, he would not say, okay, son, hey, buddy, time to wake up. No, no, no. He'd walk up to my bed and go, I'm dead asleep. I don't know he's there. Boom! And I'm just like rocking in my bed. And that's how I got, I got kicked out of bed, literally. That's how I got... Hey, welcome to your new day. It's a great way to start the day, trust me. No, I think this is kind of the way the disciples, being offended as they were, they shouted at Jesus. What a place to be. And I think we get it. Because emotionally, they're not in a good place. And they shouted at Jesus, teacher, don't you care? There it is that we're going to drown? Don't you care that we're going to drown? That's the theological storm. Jason and Candace, God sent you to this city. He gave you a word and a vision. He called it by name, Courageous Church. Five months in, global pandemic. You had to go church in the park. You had to move and move and move and move and move and move. Seven times. This is the seventh one. And it would be of no fault of these pastors to say, God, don't you care? Don't you care? You called us here. Now let me take it off the pastors. You probably have faced, are facing a storm or have faced a storm. And you've maybe not said the words, but you've definitely felt, God, don't you care about me? Don't you care about this? That's a theological question. It's not an emotional question. It's a theological. Here's, here's what it is. Pastor Jason, you know, what you're talking about up here Sunday after Sunday, I'm not experiencing in my life. You say God's good. You say God's favor. You say this. You say that. But everything I'm experiencing Monday through Saturday has nothing to do with what you're talking about. That's a theological storm. Watch this. Verse 39, when Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, silence, be still. Suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm. Then he asked them, why are you afraid? I don't think that was an accusatory question. I think it was a question to reveal. Do you still have no faith? The disciples were absolutely terrified. Oh, did you catch this? Hold on. To catch that. It's, it's really quick, but watch this. In verse 40, they were afraid. 
in verse 41, they're absolutely terrified. What has changed? From being afraid to being absolutely terrified. In verse 40, they were afraid of the circumstances, the wind and the waves. But in verse 41, they're being, they being absolutely terrified was because of the one who exhibited authority over the winds and the wave. They were afraid of the wind and the wave and the water and the boat and everything, all the circumstances, how we're going to pay the bills, how we're going to get a job, where we're going to go, this, I mean, all of the stuff that we face. But when they saw the authority of Jesus being exercised over those situations, what in the world have we just stepped into? Who is this guy? Matter of fact, isn't that what they just said in the Bible? Right in the next verse? And they looked at each other and said, who is this who controls the wind and the waves? Hello, Jesus is right there. He's hearing you talk, guys. <laughs> I love this in the, in the Bible. They're looking at each other and go, Pastor Jason, who is this guy? And Jesus is sitting there. Why don't you ask me that question? Oftentimes, we go to find answers to people who can't provide the answers when the answer is right in front of us. Jesus is standing right there. He just said, guys, I'm right here. Talk to me. I'll tell you who I am. I love that. Amen. Do you still have no faith? Ooh. Can I ask you a question as we close? Hey, Jen, can you come? Where, where'd Jen go? Can I ask this question? Where's Jesus in your life right now? If, if you're facing a storm, I want to be gentle and as kind as I possibly, I am, I'm not here throwing any stones. Trust me. But if you're in a storm right now, where's Jesus in your storm? Is he asleep? Feel like he's, doesn't even care what's going on? He's checked out. He's, he's leaving you to fend for yourself and to figure it all out. Where's Jesus in your storm? Can I, can I make some statements to you as we close? Jesus is in the boat with you. He's in the boat. He's not asleep. We are the ones who have allowed the circumstances of the storm to marginalize the power of God because we're staring at the high waves and we're listening to the wind and we feel like we're drowning. I, I want to say it this way. If I, we are the ones who need to be awakened. are the ones that have allowed our faith to dissipate because we're looking at the storm. We're listening to the winds and we're feeling the water rise. We're going to go out. We're going to drown. No. Jesus is not asleep. according to his will, according to his time, 
according to his knowledge, according to his counsel, not our counsel, his counsel. His ways are not our ways, his thoughts, he's working. So if the storm continues to rage a little bit longer, then our faith must be the be the teacher that says, no, 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 no. He is not going to let me drown because he said, come to Salt Lake City, plant a church called Courageous Church. You may move seven more times, but it doesn't matter. I don't think you will personally. I don't know what you may be facing. I don't know the storm you may be facing. You may be in it right now. Nobody might even know the storm you're facing. Maybe this is your last Sunday and you're even questioning if God is real. Maybe I need to say this. God is in your boat and he heard what you said coming to church today and he wants to tell you, I can change your storm. I can speak still, silence. I can bring the waves down. I can make them a glass. Amen. So let me ask this last question. Can I invite all of us just to have a, just a moment? Close your eyes if you would. If I can invite you just to close your eyes. And this is now your moment alone with God. Just ask this simple prayer. Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me right now? Encourage their hearts. Strengthen your people in Jesus' name. 